we'll see you back on here. So I'll, I'll, I'll get us started here. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who couldn't make the first part of this, uh, this event, I'm Ryan Monroe. I'm Senior Research Technician in Environmental Horticulture from the Plant Responses and Environment Program at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center. And uh, I want to thank, um, thank everyone for joining us today, and especially our panelists. Um, we're going to be talking about a variety of nursery soil health topics. We're excited to be joined today by three distinguished guests to have a conversation about soil health issues for nursery producers. Uh, in no particular order, uh, Ann Verhallen is a soil science graduate from the University of Guelph. She's worked for OMAFRA since 1988, starting as a soil conservation advisor working in Essex and Kent. Currently, Ann works in the area of horticultural so soil management with projects in a wide variety of soil management areas such as erosion, compaction, and water management. Promoting the use of cover crops and supporting better soil health are her passions. And fortunately, Anne had the opportunity to come out and visit a couple of our partner nurseries this summer, which was great. So she has a sense of, uh, a firsthand sense of what's going on on your different farms. Um, Aaron Agro is a professional agrologist with over 10 years of experience in nutrient management, soil science, and applied research. In her current role as growing media group manager at Walker, Erin manages an interdisciplinary team of environmental, sales, and technical professionals, and she serves as a key resource with respect to horticultural substrate analysis, applied research, and the development of engineered soils created from reclaimed materials. Lastly, Christoph Kessel recently retired from OMAFRA, where he held positions as the nursery landscape specialist and soil fertility specialist for horticulture crops. He currently consults with the horticulture industry in production, soils, soil fertility, and crop nutrition. He is also a certified crop advisor with 4R Nutrient Management Specialty. And I should mention that all of these panelist members have been involved throughout, um, throughout this project in terms of you know, consultations, phone calls. I know that Aaron, Aaron and Walker have had their own um, trial at, at NVK Nurseries as well, um, which I'm sure she can talk about a little bit as well. Uh, so just a bit of background before we start with the questions. As the moderator for our conversation today, I'll have two main roles. So first of all, we've crafted some initial questions for our panelists, reflecting issues uh, we, we anticipate and actually we probably, we, we know they're of keen interest um, from our conversations with different growers over the last three years. And secondly, I'll communicate questions from you as audience members to our panel. So please type your questions into the chat box for panelists and I'll ensure that they're posed uh, to our panelists. So question number one, and I'll, Christoph, I'll pose this to you. Just get, be patient with me because it's got, a, got some context here. Um, we've discussed soil testing and the various levels of detail available from different testing packages and labs. Uh, we've also made recommendations based on our experience with regard to the type, distribution, and frequency of soil sampling needed to understand soil health in the context of field production. Most of our discussion, however, has centered on lab tests and the physical, chemical, and biological parameters that we quantify and measure in the lab. What are some in-field tests that growers can integrate into their day-to-day -day management that supplement the information they get back from the lab? And what should they look out for on the farm to monitor soil health? All right, can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, so the, the great question there, Ryan, um, and thanks for in the invitation to participate on the panel. Um, I'd like to start with just with a, a general comment, though. I think uh, uh, Charlene was talking about the comprehensive soil testing there, so the Cornell package. The, the one thing I would really like to stress is that when, when it comes to looking at the, the, the chemical portion of that comprehensive analysis, it's important to keep in mind that those soil test extractions that they're using to do the NPK, magnesium, and all the micronutrients are not the ones that are accredited for Ontario. So a lot of precaution in how you interpret those numbers if you're using them to make soil management decisions with respect to fertility. Um, I would not be using that. I, those numbers are more of a guideline to sort of give you their assessment within the context of their soil health assessment. If you are looking to make a fertility management with respect to NPK, uh, then I would, would recommend that you're going with the Ontario recommendation or the recommended soil analysis packages for Ontario. So just to combine that with, with a comprehensive test to get a clearer picture on that. 
All right. So to answer your question, you're gonna have to tell me when I, I when it's uh, stop talking. Eh? Um, I think one of the things for infield monitoring on a daily basis, one of the biggest things I think you need to do is just get out there and walk the fields and look at the plants. So how are the plants growing? What are the color of the leaves? What's the shoot growth looking like? And when you target and see areas that, that you know are standing out differently from from other areas in the field, I think it's important then to get out your spade. Um, it's really uh, one of probably, probably the most handiest tool that you can have to do some infield monitoring right away. Dig yourself a 30 by 30 by 30 centimeter hole and just take a look to see what's happening in the roots. Take a look to see what's happening in the soil profile. Are you seeing some definition in, in the soil horizons or are you just seeing a uniform profile, which is what I expect we're going to see in most of our, our nursery soils at the time. Uh, I think in, in one of those ideas is, is you can also take a look at that point of, of compaction layers. So with a with a, either a penetrometer or with a tile probe or even a locate flag, very easy to walk around and, and check for, for compaction surface layer and inside that 30 by 30 by 30 centimeter hole that you've dug. So what's happening at the bottom of that hole? What's happening in the sides of the hole? Giving you an idea for some of the, the, the uh, problems that you might be seeing in there. Um, the other thing I think that's really important for a day-to-day -day is, is continuing with your soil diagnostics. Charlene kind of mentioned this in, in earlier on in the, the, uh, during the production cycle, but using soil analysis and tissue analysis during the production cycle to, to target some problem areas and find out exactly what's going on there. Is it a pH problem? Are we looking at micronutrient deficiencies because of the pH problem? I think those tools are really important. And when you're doing those, it's important to have a check. So have your diagnostic sample of a symptomatic area and a non-symptomatic area to be able to compare to get a bit more idea of what's happening in there. I think those are some of the tools that you can use. Another really easy one, and maybe Anne will comment on that too yet, is, is earthworm counts. If you're taking a look to see what's happening on with, with, uh, with respect to soil health, uh, certainly the more Earthworms we see in the soil, it means uh, there's a lot more activity, soil moisture going on, a lot more, less, lot less soil disturbance happening with respect to tillage. Earthworms are happy, so hopefully we're seeing a lot more organic matter uh, being turned around in uh, the activity in there. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably about it. So in field daily monitoring, I think the biggest ones are visual and walk the fields and have a spade handy in your hand. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, maybe I will uh, then hand it off to Anne and ask ask you, Anne, to kind of uh, walk us through your approach to testing the impact specifically of cover crops and amendments on farm and how you can use infield tests to compare those um, where you have a check and, and, and you have a treatment. Yeah, okay. So um, when Ryan asked me this before, because we had a chance to see these questions right off the bat, what I said was side-by-side -side trials are really important. They don't have to be large, like pick 10 trees, that kind of thing. But it, if at all possible, it should be replicated because you have to understand our soils are not consistent. They may look consistent looking at the surface, but they aren't consistent. We have soil health, but we also have inherent soil quality. So where, where Christoph talked about doing a 30 by 30 by 30 centimeter hole, I'd suggest getting the soil probe out and probing just a touch deeper to get the actual profile because you saw the picture earlier in the presentations where there's an A horizon, a B horizon, a C horizon. Generally that 30 centimeters is just going to show us hopefully the A and maybe a bit of the B. Uh, it's not going to show us what's beneath it and often there's where you get your surprises about why there's differences. Um, at least I've seen it in apple trees where there's a, a big difference in production. If at all possible, your check should be, you should have a check against your treatment. Uh, they should be replicated with the same varieties. And keep in mind that changing soil organic matter and, and structure takes time. It's not a one and done or even two years and done. It is a process and a system. Um, I know Christoph already talked about looking at crop response. I think that's really important for seeing whether you're, you're having some success. When we do uh, soil health, assessments we're looking usually at water infiltration compaction that could be using a penetrometer or in some cases i'm doing bulk density samples uh, you can also look at soil structure and i don't know whether the camera's going to pick this up or not but there's a really neat program called BESS, visual evaluation of soil structure and all you do is you take the sheet to the field and this way you can clear actually classify 
the structures that you're seeing and follow them over time. Because sometimes taking a picture or eyeballing it isn't enough. You want to put some numbers to it. And that's a lot of the reason why we do lab tests, right? So we can do a lab soil structure test, but we can also do this VAS, and this will um, help you have a lasting measurement that you can follow over time. And later I will send Ryan a link to where there's a video on how to do this. Perfect, appreciate that. Um, Aaron, I'd like to bring you in here uh, because I know that that uh, at Walker and previously, uh, maybe those of you who, who deal with grow bark uh, are aware of some of the amendments that have been trialed out on various uh, farms. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how you, you guys at Walker um, monitor and um, track the, the impacts of different organic amendment applications? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so I think uh, Christoph and Anne pretty much covered a majority of, of what we typically use. Um, so to just echo them, essentially, we're always looking at a control plot. So something that has not received an amendment versus, you know, um, a treatment plot or several treatment plots which receive different um, applications of either, you know, maybe a compost or an enriched product or something like that. And then we can monitor them over the course of the season to see how those amendments really impact the soil. So typically when we go to a field site, we're measuring, like um, Anne had mentioned, bulk density at varying depths as well, um, infiltration, respiration, um, PHEC, those are less of an infield test and more perhaps we take the sample back to our lab. Um, I always recommend too, if you're really interested to see what the impact on the organic matter is, which is what we're, we look at, that's, that's again, you have to send that away to a lab. But I think for SGS, an organic matter test is maybe 30 bucks. So a quick and easy test to kind of figure out what that impact of those amendments are. And then lastly, to kind of not talk about what everyone else has before, I just want to highlight the USDA has, um, this really cool soil quality test kit. Um, and it's something that I have used previous, previous to, to Walker actually. And if you go on their page, um, it tells you how to create a soil test kit. Um, and that within that test kit, you can actually um, run 12 tests, which include respiration, infiltration. And I think to put the test together, it's around a, a thousand bucks, sorry, the test kit itself. And it's with items that you can pick up at, you know, home hardware or something like that. Um, and it's really useful. And you pack it all in like a little toolbox. And when you go out to your field, you can do these tests, you know, on a, on a monthly basis or a three month basis. And it really kind of helps to see what the impact of your, you know, cover crops or your production um, management choices are. Um, and I think it's a really great way for people to be connected um, more to what they're doing on farm and see those improvements over time. Christoph, can I ask you to uh, comment on on uh, that more kind of more comprehensive? Uh, I don't know if Anne or Christoph, you've used that um, that USDA uh, soil quality test kit before. I've certainly seen it online. Um, so it's interesting, Aaron, that you've that you've actually put it together and used it yourself. Um, but I'm curious. Uh, yeah, maybe I can go to Christoph and see what you whether you have uh, worked with growers who've used that kit before or and um, maybe we can have a little bit of back and forth about that. Um, that's a good question and, and it's interesting just to see that uh, um, Aaron's been using it. We've used it in the past when, when I was working with the ministry and Anne can probably add a bit more. We certainly have demonstrated it at uh, uh, field days, soil management field days. Where I've used it is I've pull those components of it and, and we've, we've used them, the ones that tend to be a little bit more easier for, for growers to see. So things like the aggregate stability, um, measuring the compaction that we can do quickly in the field without having to send something away. Um, we've, we've used those ones, but I think the biggest thing always comes back to, which Anne and Aaron both have said, is you've got to have something to compare it back to. So, so whether you're using a fence row as, as your comparison, undisturbed fence row, or some part of the field uh, to get a better feel for, for, so what could this be like, or what was it like before I w we started managing this for, for field production? Um, but the ones that I found within within the, that uh, USDA kit, we've kind of 
cherry picked a few of them. And, and one of the biggest ones I still find, and, and you can do it in the field very easily, is, is as a pH, monitoring your pH. So even as, as Anne mentioned earlier, uh, and it's so true, is, is knowing what is going down, down further in the profile is one thing I found really handy is measuring what's, what's the pH in that top A horizon, what's the top pH going on in the B, you know, in, in one of the challenges I think we have in, in field production, nursery field production, is, is because we're doing bare root or because we're doing a lot of uh, wire basket digging, we're churning up that soil profile and the opportunity to start pulling up that sea horizon, which tends to be a higher pH, higher carbonates, um, just being able to measure pH with a handy soil pH monitor that you, you can pick up and, and test in the field gives you a really good idea of what, what's happening out there. Um, so I've, those are the ones I've kind of targeted is, is the really portable ones where I don't have to send out a soil sample. Like, like bulk density is important, but it's a challenge to try to take and get those numbers out there, yeah. It, yes, it is. And do you want to jump in here? Yeah, doing bulk densities are a pain. Um, they're they're time consuming, fussy. Uh, I've done that. I've done I've done a pile this fall, actually, on apple orchards and grape vineyards. Uh, probably not something a lot of growers are going to want to do, unless you've got somebody allocated to doing exactly that. Um, we have worked, like Krista said, we've worked with with the USDA kit in the past. And there's components that I really liked, and the slaking was one. So that's an aggregate stability measure, and we've used it a lot. Now, one of the newer things that are, is out, and we're just field testing it right now, is called SHAPS, Soil Health Assessment and Plan. And it is a series of tests somewhat similar to Cornell, but it is based on um, looking at Ontario conditions using Ontario fertility measurements as a background, uh, accredited lab procedures for that and then building on it using some of the same things that they use in the Cornell test but trying to keep it um, fairly economic shall we say because the Cornell sa samples are um, supported by New York State for a New York State grower so it seems really cheap until you have to pay the full full price so what with we have with shop is you do a texture measurement there's aggregate stability um, respiration, so a Solvita test, there's potentially mineralizable nitrogen, um, there's six tests, what's the other one? Active carbon. So it's, it is a series of tests that have been vetted by uh, researchers from Ontario and actually we've pulled in people from Quebec and Manitoba that have experience with this and actually out of the states and it's based on some of the work also that the Soil Health Institute has done in trying to refine the soil health tests that are out there and it's meant to be as cost effective as possible now we are field testing it right now and to do a full SHAP also involves going out in the field not just taking the soil sample and sending it off to the lab but also doing a structural assessment that vest that I was showing you and then also looking at some of your equipment and seeing how compactive it is there's a, pro a program out of Germany I believe called Teranimo and we use that so there's a number of features there to build kind of a, a point in time where your soil health is and then you can track it over time. That's very encouraging to hear because I know when we started this project and I, I know that I did get in touch with you Anne, and others to um, to inquire about the types of more comprehensive soil health tests that were out there and we did end up going with the Cornell suite of tests because it was pretty comprehensive with the caveat that the, the chemistry results are going to not be as Ontario appropriate as we'd like so um, We'll definitely be in touch about that that program. I'm, I'm going to change gears here. Um, another question, uh, and this is specifically specifically around organic amendments. Um, and this this one will be for Aaron to start us off. Um, in your experience, Aaron, can, how can commercially available organic amendments be used to complement management in field production? And can you share an example of how Walker's own organic amendments are being used currently for field tree production? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm obviously a big proponent of utilizing organic amendments and those can range from, you know, um, SSO compost or leaf and yard compost to, um, you know, Grow Mark has a number of um, like a live mulch, for instance, that we've blended compost with H bark. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. So a number of amendments that we've actually trialed on farm as well. Um, and I think the number one um, 
reason why a grower should choose to use a organic amendment is that over time with repeated applications it'll improve your soil organic matter your carbon which in that will then improve your soil structure and help to really build that that um, soil diversity of your microorganisms um, the trial that actually we were working on um, with you guys ryan at mvk we were actually hoping to see um, that our amendments would help to um, suppress disease in soil because we're adding so many beneficial microorganisms into the soil. Um, another reason why growers might want to utilize amendments is over time you might see soil loss or soil volume loss from harvesting those trees. So obviously um, with repeated applications of amendments, you'll help to continually build that soil so that you're not depleting it consistently. Um, and also uh, now with the rising cost of fertilizer, it's a really great alternative. Um, you know, our composts at GrowBark are really nutrient rich. So it's a nice alternative to either complement um, your fertilizer application or perhaps eventually wean off chemical fertilizers depending on what crop it is, right? Um, so examples of how we've used organic amendments at Walker, um, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, they have used our age bark fines for, I think, three years now as an amendment in their nursery tree production program. So they're actually applying it to the soil and tilling it in, helps to increase that porosity and again, really build that structure. Um, we've used our SPM, also known as a shredded pine mulch, um, to apply to trees to, to help improve water retention. Um, and then we've also trialed um, Enrich and our compost and our live mulch to again build soil organic matter and increase that biological diversity in, in the soil. Thanks, Erin. Um, with, uh, so we've, we've definitely spent a lot of time talking to growers about the types of both commercially available um, organic amendments out there, uh, as well as um, their ability to produce their own compost. Uh, what are some other ways, um, I'll go to Christoph first then, Anne, what are some other ways from your experience that growers um, can build organic matter specifically? Um, oh boy, build it. <laughs> patience. <laughs> I think uh, um, uh, Aaron's raised two things I just want to echo. One, one is, uh, before I get in, into that part, so, so again, looking when we're looking at bare root field production or wire basket tree production, that removal of soil, so that trying to replace that organic matter and rebuild the soil is, is really important, and, and you're going to be in for the long haul right rebuilding soil takes a really long time it's quite amazing when, when you take a look at some studies that have tried to assess the amount of soil loss from a wire basket field production there's been estimates up to 32 tons per acre per year over the cycle of a crop um, or if you're losing more than 15 tons per acre per year that's considered severe soil erosion right so so even though we're producing soil growing plants on pretty flat soil the, the erosion of the soil loss is, is is immense so i think trying to build the organic matter back by adding organic matter, increasing uh, opportunities to put in uh, manure, livestock manure, and the longer you can keep living roots in the soil, I think that, that really is gonna help you build up your organic matter and, and build, up, build up your soil structure. So anything that, that you can minimize tillage to keep the roots alive from a cover crop is, is gonna be a real, real, real bonus. And also to echo Aaron's comment too, when, whenever you're adding the organic matter, um, really have it analyzed to make sure you know how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium you're putting down because you can rebalance some of your, 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 your inorganic fertilizer inputs if you know exactly what's going in there. There's some, been some really exciting stuff going on in, in some of the field crop section and going back to the regenerative, regenerative agriculture that, that I believe Darby had mentioned earlier in, in, her, uh, in her presentation. Um, some growers who are, who are going that way, they, I mean, they've completely eliminated the need for inorganic fertilizer amendments or additions. I mean, the cycle is completely rotating and, and, and managing the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium within the cycle of system. Mind you, they have livestock is, is a huge component of, of those production systems, which may not be very practical, but you never know. Someone might come you, up with something. We, we know of, uh, sorry to interrupt Christoph, but we know of one nursery in particular that's looking at integrating livestock. So I don't know. I'd be very curious if anyone's listening on here, any other nurseries other than NVK, I know that NVK is looking at it, 
um, who's looking at integrating livestock in some way or another. Uh, we'd be curious to hear about that. Yeah. So I think I think so. So one maybe it's not so much innovative, but I think the one thing is is the grower has to be really committed to to trying to make the system work. Um, and I think they have a uh, they're they're willing to compromise maybe in the short term for long term term goals. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things. So minimizing tillage and integrating some sort of continuous organic man, amendment, integrating it into your system. I think those are probably the the things I have seen successful and and uh, there are challenges admitted in, in the nursery production system but those seem to be the ones that i think are, are working and, and maybe ann could probably we, actually we did see one who was the guy who had the sheep in the cage and it was actually moving across the field we saw, there was woody it was woody that and was had, woody that was yeah, my yeah. sheep yeah that, that, that yeah. was really interesting anyways ann over to you <laughs> Well, and actually there are more than just him. He only did that once and then he, since he's put pigs in it, in his uh, tractor. Uh, there are a number of field crop guys who are doing that kind of thing where they're running chickens or generally sheep or goats in mm -hmm. confined areas and dragging them between rows, almost a, a guarded form of silvopasture, I guess. Um, but going back to the, the question that Ryan was, I started with, Amendments are always a sure way to add organic matter. Um, that's a that, that is the surest way to add carbon. Uh, now, looking at cover crops, Christoph made some really good points around having living roots, and we know we have a better understanding about how organic matter, or how organic carbon is laid down, and it all has to go through microbes. So those living roots with their root exudates are really really important. And there is some early work from Laura Vineyard uh, down here at Ridgetown. She's been doing uh, cover crop rotation. Now this is in field crops and vegetable crops. So keep in mind, vegetable crops don't return much of anything when you're looking at squash and cucumbers and things like that. And she was working with a fairly high organic matter, like 4% uh, sandy loam soil. And even within about now at 15 years, she's definitely seen a difference in organic matter, but it was starting to show up at about the seven year mark. So you've got some real opportunities. The other thing she's seeing with that long-term use of cover crops, dedicated use of cover crops, is a lot more resiliency and water holding capacity. Mm -hmm. And Christoph mentioned about being able to reduce fert uh, chemical fertility. I'm not sure that always is gonna work, but you may be able to, to angle it back. And that's why he was saying you could adjust the amount that you're using. Uh, because what Laura has seen on her plots, and I, I realize they're not, not a nursery production, but it, it's, I think, comparable. She's actually seeing so much higher yields on the same amount of fertility with the cover crops in the rotation, that it is like just the resilience there under those little bit of droughty spells that we get off and on, not this year for most of us, but those drought spells that we get in the, the heat of summer that can really stress everything out. So cover crops and organic amendments kind of go hand in hand and reducing tillage is a part of it too. That's a good opportunity for a segue and thanks for that because now we want I want to pose to all of you um, and find out what your strategies would be what your advice would be to growers who are looking at integrating new management practices whether that's cover crops or use of organic amendments reducing tillage or a combination of of all of those. Um, we understand that that can be challenging, especially when you're trying to integrate that over many, many acres. So what would you recommend as a, as a very first step for growers who are just beginning to integrate soil health practices into their current operations? And I'll go back to you, uh, Anne, to start us off. Okay, um, sorry, this part of soil health is not kind of mom and apple pie. It's not really exciting. I, and I'm pretty sure everybody else is going to say kind of the same thing. Start small, start simple. Don't get too complicated and don't try and do everything at one point. It's a, I, although I think it does take a multifaceted approach of cover crops, reduced tillage, organic amendments. The other thing I see with, with people who get into trying more of these uh, soil health measures is set yourself up for success. Pick the right place to start. Don't pick the problem field you know, where there's say poor drainage or a huge weed problem. I, I know those are good challenges for putting these to the test, but 
set it up where where you're going to be successful right off the bat because that's more likely to keep you going and make sure it's easy to access where you're going to see it it's not the back end of of the field in the back corner i realize that you don't want anybody else necessarily to see it but it's a good idea to have it where you see it all the time and the other thing is be patient this is not a one and done this takes time and it has to fit into your system and you may have to rejig parts of the system i know when i was out on the field with ryan there are a few places where we were talking about the amount of residue and what was that doing as far as moles and voles and rabbits and all kinds of other pests as far as the the trees were concerned and i know i believe it was mvk that was talking about trying to get more um, places for hawks to hang out because that was helping to control that problem so there's always uh, anytime you make a change to a system there's a bit of a, a shift and you have to make some other shifts christoph can we get your take on this as well I, I, I would probably echo most of what Anne has said, certainly starting small. Um, I would target maybe one or two soil management uh, parameter things you want to measure, and that, that is going to be what you're going to focus on. So whether it's you, you want to man, manage the, the organic matter, so how is that number changing, or my aggregate stability number, how that is changing. So I think just you know, keep, it, keep it simple, focus on a couple of things that are important to you that you think will be you can may actually make a difference um and and that the tests are reliable so you can always go back to either a, 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 the same lab that's going to do the same test for you and so your results are comparable so one thing you really don't want to do is start jumping around from lab to lab because that's just going to really really mess up your results and you're not going to be able to make a decision and the biggest thing i think we've also talked about too is is having that baseline control. So whether you've, you've measured that soil health parameter that you're trying to improve for two seasons prior to introducing your, 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 your changes in your management, or whether you're comparing two fields side by side, but having a baseline to know, am I actually making a difference is, is I think is really important because otherwise I have no idea what's, what's doing. And I think the other one is, is make sure everyone on the farm knows what you're doing uh because it's, it's nothing's worse than having i've set it up in this one field and we're not going to till this field and out goes the guy really excited because it's a nice afternoon and he just rips up the whole field on you so everybody needs to know and have that goal or that the, the, the commitment to the soil management has to, to fill, in, filter down into every activity that you're doing on the farm so um Keep it simple, one or two tests you want to make sure you want to measure and, and be consistent with how you're being sampled and how you're getting it measured and how you're getting it analyzed. I think those are really important. On your last point there, Christoph, I'm wondering if you'd recommend to nurseries, especially larger nurseries that have a lot of employees, like, um, would, you, what would, would you recommend some kind of formalized document, a strategy or some kind of infographics that can be put up um, at signposts in different parts of the field or something like that. Like, what, what way can this be formalized for uh, larger nurseries that have a lot of management to consider? Oh, that's, that's like trying, yeah, that's a good question. I, I would think, you know, a, a staff meeting, so make sure everybody knows what, what the plan is over the winter. You're talking to them in the spring before the season starts. Posting a sign is absolutely what I would have at that the front, something really big. And I think if people understand why you're doing it, you know, um, that it, from, from a health perspective, a soil health perspective, I think a lot of people will buy into, into the image. But I think having, having signs out in the field and having a, a reminder uh, at the beginning of the season or, or um, a weekly, uh, weekly staff meetings, if that's something that the, industry, that, the, that the nursery does, I think that would be good. But signs, absolutely. You know, that's always a good one. <laughs> and make sure they're in the right languages and make sure they're big. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. I've got, we've got one more question uh, here for the three of you before we open it up to, uh, to before I start getting to the audience questions. Um, and it has to do with the future of this kind of work, uh, specifically with nursery field tree producers. So um, we're proud of the work we've been able to, to do in collaboration with our five uh, nursery partners. Um, and we, you know, internally at Vineland, uh, we have lots of ideas of what we'd like to do next. But I'd be very curious to hear about um, from each of you, uh, maybe two ideas of, of what type of research um, you'd like to see supporting uh, field nursery tree producers, uh, specifically around improving uh, soil health and, and especially helping with the management side of that, too. Uh, so, Aaron, I'll get you to go first. 
Yeah, so I kind of mentioned it earlier, but I personally would really be interested in seeing a cost benefit analysis of utilizing organic amendments versus chemical fertilizers or inorganic fertilizers. Um, looking at like the application of amendments on a large scale, like if they're not just a manure perhaps that the, grow that the grower might already have access to, it does seem like a large investment to start, especially knowing that they'll need repeated applications to, to kind of hit that organic matter target. But I think over the long term, there's a ton of, of benefits that the grower is going to get. Is it reduced chemical fertilizer, perhaps even reduced pesticide application because the soil itself is healthier, building a healthier plant. And so I'm really interested in knowing what is that on paper and how can um, that influence a grower's decision to utilize an organic amendment. Um, the other thing I'm interested in is, is knowing more about the disease suppressive properties of organic amendments. Um, we looked previously, um, did the trial uh, looking at, you know, the impact of grow bark's compost on the suppression of verticillium in soil. There's a lot of research ongoing out there um, about um, utilizing different organic amendments to suppress um, verticillium or other diseases and it would be interesting um, to work with Vineland and see how you know grow barks organic amendments might be might be useful to a grower um, in that sense thanks Aaron yes we'd like to we've definitely that's come up as a, as an important priority for us in terms of integrating that cost benefit analysis of whatever practice it's going to be whether it's um, transitioning towards reduced tillage which has its reduced it does reduce tillage costs, but it can have other impacts as well. Or use, you know, cover crops also cost money to buy buy the seed and plant the seed. And I mean, obviously, with organic organic amendments as well, it's a it's a can be a significant investment. So you want to understand over time how that plays out. Um, Christoph, I'll go to you next for your ideas. There you go. Um, so the two ideas I I thought would be really exciting to take a look at. We kind of mentioned a few of them already i think today one is in taking a cue from some of the stuff that's going on in field crop production granted it, it is a little bit different than the nursery or perennial production like like a, a nursery setting but i think if we could come up with the system where you have living roots growing all year round not just not just your your, your perennial woody trees but if you had some sort of cover crop where we could manage living roots all year round um i think that would be one very interesting project. Another one I think that'd be exciting to see again, taking a cue from the field crop industry, um, would be strip till planting. So, you know, could you could you grow a cover crop and 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 then kill a specific strip and that's what I'm gonna plant my 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 trees into. And could I do this over a seven year cycle? So so if I take a field, I plant a cover crop into it and I strip till into a, a two year crop and that's what's gonna grow in that that spot and I may maybe manage it the 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 a strip underneath it with herbicides or something but after those two years i can pull that crop out reseed the strip and then plant a five-year crop in the into the rows in between that two-year crop that have been, now been undisturbed for for two years so essentially i could be getting some parts of that field being covered for seven years and only parts of it that have been managed for two years and for five years i think so looking at something that a long-term project like that i think that'd be that'd be very exciting I think that would be fascinating too. Yeah. Do you have yeah. do you do you know what kinds of cover crop mixes would you'd you'd recommend for that kind of trial? Wow, that's uh I'd bring Ann in for that and use that Midwest sure. Cover Crop Council. But I but I, but no, going back to some of Laura's work down in Ridgetown, and I think wheat has been one of the the, the crops that really seem to to help build that soil structure and build that soil health. How, how feasible that would be in the in a nursery setting, I'm I'm not sure. That that's uh, Vineland's job to do, right? <laughs> Yeah, I know that the, for sure. NVK has played around with uh, with weed and oats and different different things. But I guess you would you be looking at a perennial mix uh, for that scenario, or would you be looking at reseeding, Krista? Oh, I think I, I would try to be looking at. A, at a, I think a perennial mix would be good, or and then something maybe that you could reseed on top of with some annual stuff. Okay, I think that uh, that would be ideal. Yeah, but now the, now the, the research would be what's the competition with the tree roots and do I need to go in and manage herbicide strips underneath or something like that? Uh, but that, that would be to, to look up. I think whether you could do that for a field over a seven year cycle, that would be, uh, that would be exciting. And what do you think? 
Oh, I think there's so many exciting things to, to look at. I, I'd like to see us keep, keep on with some of the work that you've been doing because it's only been a couple of years. You can't really tell for some of them how that's all. And I think there's refinements that can be made. So that's maybe not the most creative thing. I think we need to know more about nutrient release from even the, just the cover crops. And building on what Christoph was talking about, it's interesting for anybody who wants to take a look at it uh, through the Ontario Soil Network. Woody Van Arkel is part of that. And you, if you go to the Ontario Soil Network, you can take a little video tour of his, his operation. And, it, and his emphasis in recent years has been on perennial crops. He's trying to perennialize his annual field crop production. So he's growing a couple different kinds of clovers and then basically taking it a strip to grow corn in. And the one that right now gets me kind of excited is the subterranean clover because it looks cool. So you seed it, say the late summer, fall. I have some in my garden that I'm, I'm gonna play with this, this coming summer. Um, it grows through the fall, it will overwinter, It'll come into flower in early, early spring. And it's a weird clover because the seeds are actually set underground. So it'll flower, set its seeds underground and basically die down for most of the summer. And then late summer, those seeds will get going again and you'll get this lovely green cover. So the, the heat of the summer, all you've got are brown dead clover plants, kind of a, a dry mulch on, on the surface. We're trying this in some vineyards, and actually I have a little bit out in a local apple orchard because they're wanting to, to get into the to cover crops that are right underneath the crop. I think something like that would be really interesting. And the other piece I had here that I wanted to mention, Christoph and I were talking about this earlier, about the whole strip tillage type of idea. And it's funny, about oh five, six years ago, I established a conservation planting on our place, on our farm, and actually that went into standing wheat and what I did was I, I sprayed out the strip where the trees were going, planted into that and rolled the wheat at when it was full out and head. So similar to the roller crimping type of concept that you would do with cereal rye. And the weed control I got was actually kind of amazing because wheat is not the greatest for suppressing weeds, but the weed control in between the rows was, was great. I was uh, really happy to see it. I know that we were working with, a, we did a contract with a, um, a dairy farmer, but looking to establish trees. And we, we recommended the same approach, although he's organic, so we'd be looking at tilling up and preparing those beds rather than spraying, but the same kind of approach. So I'd be curious to see if he, did, if he follows through and how that one works out as well. Um, so I'm cognizant of the time. We've got about 13 minutes left and we have, a, but three or four questions here that have come through from audience members. So I'll, um, I'm going to kind of combine um, two of them here because they're pretty similar. So Steve S. said that, um, that he likes to check 120 centimeters down when he does a soil profile. So he wants to know what's going on below the plow layer. Um, so it's more of a comment, but then with that as context, Jason Henry is asking about um, assessment of soil compaction on farm. Uh, a penetrometer and bulk density was mentioned. He said, how easy are these to conduct in, in the field and how much would it cost to implement either or? Do you want me to go or? Whoever Who wants to. <laughs> okay. Open discussion so, now. So as far as assessing compaction, uh, Christoph talked about digging a hole and that's one of the first ways to go. The other way is with a penetrometer or bulk density. For on-farm, unless you've got somebody dedicated to it or you're going to bring somebody else in to do the bulk density, I uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't do it. It's, it's a good number. You need to do a lot of them and they need, I feel they need to be larger bulk densities rather than the small tiny tiny rings that many people use. Penetrometer though, still takes uh, some skill, patience, and the right soil moisture to really show much. That said, if you're not looking for an exact number, if you're just trying to find layers, uh, you can do that with a shovel, with a soil probe, with a tile probe, even with those drainage flags. If you're looking for a pattern of compaction across the field 
or just trying to find that layer to see if there's a layer and then dig down to it to see how bad it is. You do need to be doing that when the soil is moist, not soggy wet, because then it's just like butter anyways, and not dry. Because we know as soils dry out, the resistance goes up. So everything, especially with the penetrometer, everything will show as being compacted. When you're using any of those implements, whether it's a penetrometer or you know, a, a soil probe or something like that, the biggest thing is to, you have to insert the, the tool into the ground in a slow, steady, consistent, and it's not slow, slow, it's still fairly quick, but you're doing it slowly and consistently, paying attention to what your hands are feeling and not just ramming it into the ground. Because I, I've watched guys just, you know, it's not a, a muscle testing exercise, it's can I feel what's going on in the soil? So it's not that hard to do and it doesn't necessarily take, um, you know, a penetrometer. Plus penetrometers tend to walk out of backs of pickups. <laughs> Tile probes and drainage flags are less likely to. I w yeah, I would, we've used, we've used all of these different methods and um, we've certainly done a lot of bulk dense, thousands of bulk density sampling and it's, uh, it is quite labor intensive even once you're fast at it. Um, and you do need to take a lot. And the penetrometer we started using a couple of years ago uh, because it was part of the Cornell um, soil health protocol. Um, and totally get your points there. But yeah, I would, I would also, from our perspective, um, when we wrote the Ontario Landscape Tree Planting Guide, we recommended using a, a flag or a shovel um, because it's everyone has those and it's simplest. Yeah. And also, uh, I think like it's got a lot of stone. The penetrometer is not going to work well. Bulk densities don't work particularly well in soils with a lot of gravel. Yeah. Then yeah. you're still better off with a, a flag. You can only push a flag so far so fast. I will add, yeah, just for those um, who are in Ontario and may be familiar uh, that Growbark has sort of um, an on-field testing regime that we participate in with our growers. Typically, it's for container nursery production, checking the EC and pH. But if a grower was interested in determining, um, you know, production practice differences between a control and an amendment, uh, a field that has received amendments, we hire multiple co-op students and they are more than happy to come out there and do some bulk density testing for you. We have all the all the probes ready. So um, that could potentially be an add-on for those of you who participate in that that, uh, that field program that we offer. Thanks, Erin. I think we'll move on to uh, the next question here because we've got, we've got about three or four left. So um, if I can just quickly summarize this one. Uh, Steve, S is asking about um, recommendations around controlling weeds or invasive plants that will be on the root on tree root balls from cover crops. So I'm not sure exactly what Steve is um, specifically asking about. He says I noted a new invasive species in a tree root ball planted in Toronto this spring. So I don't know if I'm not sure if that's the cover crop issue or if it's just a local invasive species that have made their way into the field. I don't know if anyone wants can to comment he, on that. Can you type into the chat what exactly it was? Yeah, he did. So, so Solanum caroliniense. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that one. It's Carolina horse nettle, looks like. Yeah, that shouldn't be coming out of cover crop seed if it's a decent no. seed supplier. <laughs> Yeah, I think this this has always I think been a challenge from my experience with with uh, with B and B trees or wire basket trees, right? Because you're you're always going to move soil with them. So uh, um, I think that the challenge is always going back to 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 grower trying to ensure that they are managing and trying to manage the weeds as as well as they can, um, either through herbicides or, or you know hate to say it but tillage, um, or even removing the, the the upper layer of soil just making sure you pull those those roots out, out before you actually wire it in basket and, and, and lift the tree. Um, granted, there's still going to be roots that are being moved with, with the ball, um, but you're at least trying to remove any potential seed sources coming out of there. But that's, that's always been, been a challenge with, with, uh, with wire basket trees is, is, is the, the potential to move, you know, weeds from one area to, to another. Yeah. Along a similar uh, vein here, 
somewhat similar. Um, so Ann Huber asks, uh, she says, as I understand it, some cover crops may be problematic with respect to being hosts for diseases or insect pests. Are there major issues and is there a resource for growers that covers this issue in, in terms of cover crop selection? And I just quickly mentioned that the uh, Midwest Cover Crop Council decision tool has notes on that kind of thing if you go in to the detailed notes, but I'll, I'll hand it back to you guys to, to comment on that. Okay, so the, the Midwest Cover Crop Council decision tool is one place where you can find that. It gets updated fairly regularly. And one thing I should have made a mention of, Ryan said that it was just OMAFRA. It's really a lot more than OMAFRA that fed into that. It's actually got a steering, for the Ontario content, there's a steering committee of uh, seed suppliers and farmers and researchers. It's, it's certainly not just OMAFRA. The other thing that the Midwest Cover Crop Council puts out is a field guide. This is the old one. Uh, there's a new one that will be shortly released, actually beginning of December. You can tell the difference. This one's got crimson clover. The next one will have um, hairy vetch on the front. And they do have some ratings around nematodes in particular and some of the other disease uh, pathogens. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, and thanks for pointing out that there are a lot of people involved in the, the Midwest Cover Crop Council. That's important. Um, just so that we can not run out of time, I want to get to Cody Brown's question. Uh, he's asking, when you talked about cover crops, has anyone done cover crops in tree production rows, not just in rows where tractors drive? So I think, um, and I know we visited NVK where they were trialing out some of this stuff. And then I know that we talked a little bit about, you mentioned that some vineyards were using buckwheat, for instance, right under, underneath their vines. So, um, but I can, whoever wants to comment on that, feel free. give uh, Christoph and Aaron an opportunity as well. So, so I, I guess what I've seen, maybe not so much in the, in the nursery side of things, and this goes back to the earlier conversation we had of trying to, to maintain living roots all the, all, all the time, how long he maintains during the season. But, uh, but I've, we've seen some um, apple orchards playing around with the idea where they've actually let uh, the cover crops or, or just the, the sod and the mixture of, of cover crops, whatever they're growing inside. So it could be initially a selection of planted, but it becomes weedy at some point growing up to the bottom of the roots. And they've been trying to, to manage that way again, trying to either use it for a, for a nitrogen management perspective of trying to, or trying to ma maintain some of the erosion control. So there are some uh, long-term perennial growers who are playing around with it. Um, but I think it does introduce some new challenges to the nursery growers, you know, Back to the other, other gentleman's question. Well, so what am I moving with that tree ball to, to that new location? So there, there's some aspects of it with, with respect to the soil health, but also future management with respect to where the tree is going to end up in, in, in the future. Um, yeah. yeah. And in terms of and competition, I'm curious about it. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna add to what Christoph said. Where there, there's an apple grower that I'm working with on that subterranean clover and some of his concern, I think it might apply to your nursery growers too, is where they let the grass uh, invade underneath the row. He was starting to see that it's almost, uh, some of those tall growing grasses become almost like a, uh, oh, a ladder for some insects, allowing them to get up into the crop canopy a little too easily. So that's part of the reason why we're looking at the subterranean clover underneath the tree so that it, uh, hopefully can, can keep the grasses back and it's low growing enough that it's not in contact with any of the lower branches and uh, kind of interrupting that, that pest schedule a little bit more. Yeah, that's definitely uh, something that um, I'm curious about managing the, the, the competition with, with tree roots, um, finding that perfect cover crop, but there's never going to be a perfect one, but that, that nice mix that can balance out um, providing, maybe providing some nitrogen, some weed suppression, um, keeping the soil from getting, um, from drying out as fast, that living mulch. Uh, it, it's tricky because I know the research I've read on, mainly on apple orchards has found that it's, you know, it's challenging, like that mulch, you know, mulch would be the best, but it tends to be more expensive. Um, 
and then after that herbicide strip performed pretty well <laughs> and i know like a, a lot of uh, growers are using um, also using like tillage to to maintain or hoeing to maintain a weed free area but uh, i guess there's no easy answer to that one unfortunately so I think it goes back to, to someone else asked a question earlier about uh, the disease in, in the insect aspect of, of the cover crop. So I think in your future projects, Ryan, when, when, when you're looking at, at establishing, so how are we managing cover crops, I think you need to integrate the disease and the insect aspect. It kind of even goes back to what Aaron said to what's the disease suppression of, of some of these, these organic amendments, but what is also the effect on the insect population? And, and you may even find that a lot of these cover crops bring in a whole whack of beneficial insects and are helping you to reduce some of the other insect management problems you, you have got going on there. So yep. I think you know, we have to move from just focusing on what's the soil health, but what's the overall impact in the whole production system with respect to my insect disease management as well. That's a great point. Yeah, it's a systems approach, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll have to wrap it up here. Unfortunately, it's 11.59. <laughs> and I see Darby's joined us again. So I just want to thank all um, Aaron, Ann, and Christoph, thank you all again. It's been a pleasure having you uh, on our panel and to have you involved in the in the project over its duration. So um, thanks again, and I'll hand it back to Darby. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, great discussion, guys. That was really exciting. I jumped over to the audience link there and got to, to listen in. So thank you guys so much. Um, I'll just ask the panelists to hang on for a few minutes while I say a few thank yous, and then we'll sort of end the live stream for, for the rest of the gang that's watching us from across Canada. So I want to echo, echo uh, Ryan's uh, sentiments. I really want to thank Anne, Christoph, and Aaron for joining us today, and, and also for, you know, variously helping us throughout the duration of this project. So you see them here today, but they've been, you know, really great resources for us. Um, you know, when we, we have questions that we need other experts to help us answer. So certainly we don't do any of this alone. Um, and I want to thank especially Landscape Ontario, our project partner, and of course our ongoing supporter of our work, and our five nurseries who have allowed us to work with them uh, over the past roughly three years. So NVK Nurseries, Winkle Mullen Nursery, Cobus Nursery, Hillen Nursery, and Conan Nurseries. And a special thank you to Tony and Joe Sabatino from Landscape Ontario for working with us behind the scenes to keep this project rolling. I also want to thank send a thank you to Walker Environmental and Growbark. So special thank you again to Aaron Agro for uh, working on this project with us, as well as Keith Osborne and Katie Curie, who also you know have been helping us build these resources for our nursery partners. A big thank you to my team at Vineland and our colleague, uh, Samantha Wachowski, who helped us plan and run this event today. So with all the behind the scene folks who keep uh, these new virtual platforms going, thank you very much to everyone. And finally, this research project is funded in part by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs through the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. So thank you to our funders for supporting this important work. And finally, just a thank you to everyone who's out there joining us today and who's willing and, you know, excited about learning about soil health. I think the best part for me when I get to talk to other experts, and I wouldn't consider myself an expert actually, is, is the fact that we're all still learning about this really important topic. So I really appreciate the time that everyone has taken to pose questions and to, to engage in this discussion, which of course is not an end point. I think it's really a starting point. So thank you to everyone out there. And with that, we're gonna wrap up. I think we should have some resources that were requested by some of the participants in the chat. And then also we will be sharing those resources out uh, by email to everyone that was invited to the discussion today. So we'll chat with Christoph, Anne and Aaron to collect some of those and make sure that we get them directly to you. So with that, we'll sign off and hopefully we'll get to see you all again soon. Thank you so much.